dangerous day, so it seemed, for the man of God. For some time now, Elijah had been thwarting the plans of the Syrian king. Learning through a prophetic gift what serious tactical maneuvers were going to be, and then reporting them to Israel's king, who could take evasive action. One day the Syrians had had enough. You can read the story in 2 Kings chapter 6. By night they came and surrounded Dothan, where Elisha was living. In the morning, Elisha's servant rose and saw the dread hosts of Syria all around, and he was terrified. There were Syrian warriors on every side, and there was no way out for Elisha and his servant. The servant, as I said, was terrified. Elisha was not. Elisha was not alone. He assured his servant, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. He prayed for God to open his servant's eyes, and when the veil was torn away, he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now that's a heavy security detail. If I'm right. <coughs> the Syrians, in fact, were quite outnumbered and outmatched that day by a greater army one they couldn't see, but which blazed with celestial flame behind the scenes. What sort of army was it that defended Elisha that day? It was the same kind that came to retrieve Elisha's prophetic mentor, Elijah, whisking him away by a whirlwind into heaven in a chariot of fire. This mysterious military unit of the Lord who maketh his angel spirits and his servants in flaming fire is not one I would want to tangle with. So often when we think in, in, in popular culture, even in the church of angels, we see them as our paintings, as our greeting cards picture. Effeminate men in white robes with soft and delicate features, if not actually little babies flying around on their wings. Saccharine, sweet, and harmless. It's very pretty. It has virtually nothing to do with how the Bible actually depicts angels. Setting aside the, the, the cherubim and seraphim, very specific sorts of heavenly created beings, one of the first times we really meet angels in Scripture, it's at a town called Sodom. The angels have come to rescue Abraham's not terribly bright nephew Lot. When the crowd turned hostile, the angels struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great. Even still, Lot was hesitant to leave town, so the angels grabbed him and hauled him and his family past the city limits by force. Soon after, fire and brimstone rained down and wiped Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam, and Zeboiim off the map. The angels said they had plenty to do with it. They said, we are about to destroy this place. The Lord has sent us to destroy it. Don't mess with them. As we keep reading the Bible, we read about a mysterious destroyer who Death came to the Egyptian firstborn as the tenth plague. Moving out into the desert, we read of how a pagan sorcerer, hoping to profit by coming to curse the people of God, found an invisible presence in his path as he rode his donkey down the road. When his eyes were opened, he saw the angel of the Lord standing in his way with a drawn sword in his hand, preparing to strike Balaam down. Many, many years passed, in the days of King David, who had given in to a devilish temptation, God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Not what we want to see. Many years later, after 
Elisha and his servant had a fiery army of angels as bodyguards. We read that Jerusalem was threatened by Assyrian soldiers. But Isaiah promised David's descendant Hezekiah that God would save him. And that night, we read, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 <coughs> in the camp of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians decided it was a good time to gather. All this to say, angels, whatever heavenly beings God is using as messengers, they tend not to be neat, picturesque, quiet, harp-strumming figures like we imagine in our sweet little songs. They come armed and dangerous, ready for war. We know they fight or fought against the devil's forces, including at times the humans who do his bidding. And so one otherwise silent eve in the fields around Bethlehem, beneath the star-speckled canvas of black and night, in all its Christmas, one can understand why a sudden invasion by heaven's army would be cause for alarm. Everything had been quiet. Everything had been normal. Until an angel showed up. And when he said his initial piece, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, like stars crashed to earth. Heavenly host, multitude. That's Bible talk for a whole army regiment sent from heaven. What the shepherds beheld that night was no small or innocent choir. This was a powerful army armed to the teeth, appearing seemingly from nowhere. That's enough to be quite unsettling. But this heavenly army regiment sang a song. They chanted a chant on their march. You might expect it to be a song of war. Those who have served in the American Armed Forces, maybe you remember <coughs> some of the songs you might have chanted on a march, in camp, or out in the field. But the end of this song should strike on earth peace among men well pleasing. We mention in so many of our carols this declaration of Peace on earth. Now we look around us, we look within us, and what we see looks like a war zone. People are getting hurt out there. Disease and fire run rampant. Calamity is common. People scheme and betray each other. They fight in secret, they fight openly, with words, with fists with blades and bombs and bullets. Maybe you remember the lyrics to another Christmas song. In despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. In the middle of the war zone, there's little news that would be better than peace on earth. Everything torn in pieces, fitting back together seamlessly and harmoniously at last. The truth is, ever since a faraway garden we read of long ago, there's been a rebellion going on. We've refused so frequently to just listen to our king and submit to his wisdom. Sometimes in his very own name we've gone out and done great damage. Ask 20 randomly selected young folks today what sorts of things they know people have done in God's name. You'll hear more than you bargain. Just as often people have set themselves up in opposition to the king's name. We wanted to be as gods, able to decide for ourselves what is good and what is evil. 
And in every act of sin, that's exactly what we do. We declare our own definition to supersede the heavenly one. We incessantly declare war on heaven. War on earth. War on each other. War on our own selves. And the context of that kind of rebellion, it's striking, isn't it, to have heaven's army finally march down to earth as one on their greatest campaign yet, crowding into a single field to take their stand, all lined up in battle array. But what they've come to proclaim is not the start of hostilities, but their end. Peace. Ceasefire. Treaty. To rebel fighters, to enemies. Here comes heaven's army offering terms of peace to all those who are well pleasing, those who lay down the fight and return to heaven's calls. They ask us, aren't we tired of all the fighting? Aren't we tired of all the pain? Aren't we tired of all the lies, all the strife, all the anger and the chaos, all the destruction and the carnage? Aren't we tired of it? Who doesn't have a part of himself or herself saying yes? Heaven's army has come to offer terms of peace. There is total amnesty on the table. What more could we really ask for? What more do we want for the possibility to rebuild after we've seen our fight go so wrong and cause such collateral damage all around us again? Peace on earth. What we wouldn't give. How can we have this peace on earth? Where's it going to come from? How can heaven's peace be ours here? It seems like that harmony is so easily disturbed, so easily tipped out of balance and damaged or destroyed. We're good at that at all. But the angel army has come to explain. You see, the, the, the second half of their song told us the what, the first half of their song tells us the how. The first step of the how, at least. Glory. To God in the highest. Glory in Genesis day. Glory to God. In biblical tradition, one key meaning of the word for glory is for something to be heavy. Heavy things can do that. When something has glory, when something has heaviness, it has real heft, it has real weight to it, real significance and importance. Think for a moment about the sun. Maybe you've seen it, hopefully not too directly. The sun glows brightly. The sun can be very beautiful. But the sun exerts a gravitational pull on all the planets in our solar system. Because it is just so massive that it draws us in. In biblical terms, the sun is glorious. Here on earth, our lives orbit many things. We're constantly caught between the gravitational attraction of this and that celebrity, this and that cause, this and that job, this and that home. This and that person or place or thing. We're always finding something to glorify. Something to deem as having real gravity to hold us in place and give us meaning. Something to center our lives around and order. The problem is that's not how things were meant to be. We were meant to glorify God in the highest, to place Him at the center of our lives with everything else 
in orbit around him, caught in God's gravitational pull. Only when God is glorified, made central with his gravity submitted to, do we at last find a stable course in which to move. When God is glorified, then everything else can share one center. And instead of crashing into each other or veering far apart in the cold and dark reaches of space, orbit <coughs> and order around one God. Only when orbiting in order around the real source of light and warmth can we finally taste true peace. That brings us to a problem. The problem is that when it comes to God, we seem to have a bad case of some kind of anti-gravity thing going on. There's something within us that actively seeks to repel him, to repel each other. We've drifted so far because of it. And we've got no way of propelling ourselves through space to reach him. And without that, how could we ever get back and find our place in his orbit again? We can only find real peace, the peace offered by heaven's armies, by giving ultimate glory to God. But how is that possible for rogue planets wandering in outer darkness? How does a rogue wandering planet come home to true order? That's where the rest of the angelic message comes in. What the angels came to say was that there is just such a way. Precisely one way, it, it turns out. Our aversion to God's glory has to be cured. We have to be propelled back into his orbit. We have no ability to do that ourselves. We have no power to rewrite the laws of fallen physics in our fallen nature. Nor do we have power to learn to resonate with God in, in, in our weak and imperfect hearts. Nor do we know how to chart a course back to Him, and certainly not under our own steam. That sounds hopeless, but here is the message that we needed to hear. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The long-awaited Messiah had finally come into our moment of deepest darkness. He did not descend from the clouds, fully grown and robed in white like his armies did that silent night. No, he was a newborn, meant to grow up on the same earth as one of us, to cure us from the inside out. He came to be where we are, to be our healer, our rewriter, our propulsion, to bend space and time to lead us back to the divine brightness we fled so long ago. And so Christ the Lord came to be our Savior. He stills the chaos within our soul. He ends the war between heaven and earth. For how can heaven's armies besiege the city where their king came to dwell? And who has an earthly body dwelling here still? Christ the Lord came to be our Savior. He anchors the adrift and carries the lost and alone. When we were wandering in the darkest night, He came to reunite us with God's glory, God's gravity. Christ came like a holy graviton to renew the inviting, welcoming force of God on our lives. This Savior mediates the gravity of God in person, face to face. 
He turns us back toward the light and tugs us to the beauty and warmth of holy love. No more need we drift aimlessly. No more need we orbit the dwarf stars of our idols. No more need we crash, split, fracture in the empty voids of mere existence. We're called back to the glory of God, called back to life, to health, to peace completeness to where we belonged all along. Because to us was born that day a Savior who can rescue us when we can do nothing to rescue ourselves. It may not be a smooth ride back to the warmth of God's glory. After all, as we move through space toward His pole, we may find ourselves pelted by the meteorites of opposition, and the asteroids of hardship and tragedy. Jesus himself said, I have come, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. As we get close to where the real gravity is, all sorts of things may come our way. But in the long term, peace is exactly where we'll be when he's through drawing us in. <clears throat> no wonder then the angelic spokesman for heaven's army calls this good tidings of great joy. A return to our original orbit. A restoration of balance and harmony. A ceasefire with superior forces. A healing for our wounded hearts. A hope of life and life again. That's pretty joyful. That's the activity of God and the Savior He sent out to our far reaches on an expedition all the way here for we are. And to announce it, to announce peace on earth for all those who accept the favor of this rescue mission to those of us lost in space. That's some greeting. Those are truly some good tidings as far as I'm concerned. This is good news. This is gospel. Right there. The gospel of great joy. What the angelic spokesman literally says here is, I evangelize you. I evangelize some great joy. Yes, the angel is an evangelist. At first blush, he may seem scary. He may seem unsettling, unnerving, discombobulating, but he's got a gospel to tell. He has good news to proclaim with great joy at its side and at its weight. It's no wonder the angel's evangelism is experienced at first as being so disconcerting. After all, his message is accompanied by the glory of God, a lurching shift of gravity for the unwitting shepherds who saw and heard. But this same evangelistic message can set people free from the feeble gravity of dim and degenerate stars, free from the coldness and emptiness, free from chaos and rebellion, free from the inevitable atrophy and entropy and aimlessness of perfunctory existence and meaningless drudgery. The angel's evangelism points simply to a Savior who rescues us from all these ills and through whom we experience the light and life of God afresh. And the joy giving entrance of that Savior into our forlorn and war torn world is just what Christmas is, after all, about. 
We may not, like Elijah's servant, catch a glimpse of horses and chariots of fire on the mountain. We may not, like Hezekiah, survey Assyrian carnage in a destroying angel's path. And we may not, like the shepherds, hear the armies of heaven chant their ceasefire before our eyes and ears. Though for all I know, we may well, like Abraham and Gideon, Manoah, and many saints, entertain angels unawares. But there remains plenty we can learn from this celestial invasion. If we yield beneath the pole of our Savior's nail-scarred but freshly living hands, we will fall more and more under the pull of God's glory. Other purported centers of gravity will lose their attraction. And as we look more and more to the gravity of God, become drawn to Him, become warmed with His glow and transfigured with His beauty, we will find that things fall into place. Yes, the petty rocks that cross our path may pockmark us with craters, they may throw plenty of irritating dust in our lives. But for all that, the only place to find our peace is in God's orderly orbit through our Savior's work. The time for drifting lost in space is done. The time to be found and brought back is now. And like the angel, we are called to evangelize, called to communicate the good news, this good news, in real and practical ways, in word and in deed, to bring great joy. We are called to share a Savior's guidance with those still lost in space, to minister a Savior's touch to those adrift or fractured apart. To reflect God's glory out into the darkness and to announce and illustrate joy and peace in God's order. That's a tall order. We can admit that. It can be intimidating. But I say this to you. Fear not. For ever since the ceasefire was called at the Savior's birth, those who are with us are so many more than those who are with them in the world. Thanks be to God.